Oh gosh, I've been waiting ages for a bus. Not as long as me. The wait is over. This week, Click takes a ride around a smarter city where big queues are giving way to big data. We'll also breathe heavily over the uplifting tech that keeps England's finest on the ball. All that plus the latest tech news and a music tutorial that makes playing the guitar as easy as E-A-D-G-B-E -E in Webscape. Welcome to Click, I'm Spencer Kelly. These days, more and more ordinary objects are going online and telling the world about themselves, giving off information about where they are and what they're doing. And the grand vision is that one day, all of this data will be gathered and processed and used to make our lives easier and to help make systems and whole cities run smoother and smarter. <laughs> Cities generate an enormous amount of data every day. In London, 8 million residents can already find out where and when their trains, buses and planes will arrive. The information is all there, available through a multitude of apps and websites. And it's not only the transport network that broadcasts its status, we do too. If you own an Android smartphone, for example, the chances are your location and speed are being collected and turned into live traffic information on Google Maps. Parking spaces are also getting smarter. In this exclusive part of town, an exclusive trial is helping dapper clientele find a well-fitting spot. These sensors in parking bays report back their availability every few seconds, allowing visitors to find vacant spaces through this app. But it's not just about parking right now. These graphs should give an insight into the likelihood of finding a space at any time of the day you choose. Over time, this collected data can also help the council to make better parking arrangements. What we've been able to establish is that we probably haven't got the parking mix right in Savile Road. So we might have too many residence bays, we might have too many casual parking bays. So what we're doing with that data is saying, look, perhaps we can use this to reconfigure the streets and provide more spaces for, the, for people that actually need them at the right times of the day. Smart parking, smart buses, smart trains, smart us. But what's not so smart is the fact that all of these projects are separate ventures and they don't talk to each other. And that means that in London, at least, the data generated by all these apps is the only thing guaranteed to flow freely. For a city to get smarter, you need to draw them all together. And that's why we've come here, to Dublin. Like many cities, it already has plenty of sensors about the place. It has traffic cameras. Hello there. It has sensors under the tarmac to detect traffic flow. The buses report their positions back to base. But crucially, this city has volunteered itself to be a test bed, to see what happens when you gather all that information together and to see whether it can be used to predict the future. At IBM's Dublin Research Centre, a new traffic management system is analysing the city's circulation, trying to spot patterns in the ebb and flow of the traffic. Incidents, accidents, closures and weather can all have knock-on effects beyond their immediate surroundings. And by watching what happens after particular combinations of events, the system should be able to advise officials on how a future problem might affect the city's nervous system. And it won't just rely on Dublin's official eyes and ears. It will also mash up social network updates like our own moans about the traffic and other information streams such as the weather report and even rising groundwater levels. 
Assimilating all of this data into a big picture means that potential problems can be spotted and resolved before they even become problems. Taking that data and then breaking it down and building models. So what's the relationship between weather and, and how people drive? What's the relationship maybe between temperature or humidity? What's the relationship between, you know, is it the day of the week or the, the time of the day? And so what we need to do is we, we, we need enough data to build models that can then help us to, to predict and optimize more accurately. So that's part of the research is to say, we need effective methods to handle very large volumes of data, but we also need very effective algorithms so that we can do predictions when we've never seen the data for that. The ultimate goal is to use a city's existing infrastructure more intelligently rather than expanding it. If a train is delayed, for example, the bus outside the station should know that it has to wait so it doesn't travel empty and leave the next one to be overcrowded. This app, still in the early stages of development, uses these sophisticated prediction algorithms to minimise journey times and, just as importantly, waiting times between each mode of transport. It will know about any congestion and also use historical data to tell you how that might affect your onward journey and make a more reliable estimate of your arrival time. It should also know if there are any city hire bikes available and then guess whether there will be a space to dock it at your destination at that time of day. Increasingly it will be more about a personalised kind of system. So your bus is there in five minutes, off you go. You get on board the bus, as, you, as you're on the bus and you get another ping saying, look, there's an accident ahead, you're better off getting off this bus, picking up a, a Dublin bike or something like that and, and, and moving off. So all the way through your journey, you're being provided with information and you're also providing information back as you travel through. You may be by your tweets, by your text, whatever it is, maybe saying, look, this is a really slow bus, this is a really good route, whatever. And even when you're sitting in the pub in the evening, you know, and it's coming close to the last bus, you get a ping saying, look, your last bus is 10 minutes away, do you want to go? Or look, here's the nearest taxi rank, you know, here's how much it will cost, here's, here's who's there. A smarter city is also a greener city. For example, fewer traffic jams mean fewer idling vehicles spewing harmful emissions into pedestrians' airspace. Current attempts to reduce pollution haven't proved quite as smart. In Mexico City and Beijing, for example, each car is forbidden from driving for one day a week, depending on the last digit of its license plate. But that just led to drivers avoiding the ban by buying a second car with a different license plate. And it's in the developing world where IBM hopes to make the biggest impact. These are the movements of the citizens of Abidjan in the Ivory Coast, captured by monitoring mobile phone signals. By observing the flow of the workday, bus routes can be extended to ease the congestion in particularly busy areas. By 2050, 9 billion people 70% of us will live in cities, with the most expansion expected in the developing world. By helping to plan and shape the circulation now, those cities stand more of a chance of breathing more freely for longer. OK, next up, a look at this week's tech news. A student falsely linked to the Boston Marathon bombings on a social media site has been found dead by members of his university rowing team in a river near Rhode Island. It's not clear exactly when Sunil Tripathi, who'd been missing since March the 16th, died. He was one of two people wrongly identified as suspects by users of the site Reddit. Reddit had already apologised both to his family and publicly after discussions about the bombings provoked an online witch hunt with the pair's names and pictures trending on Twitter and being printed on the front page of the New York Post. Another news agency fell foul of a suspected phishing attack this week. Associated Press's at AP Twitter account published a bogus post about explosions at the White House. The post caused stock markets to dip temporarily with the Dow Jones shedding 150 points or $137 billion before it became clear the account had been hacked. A group calling itself the Syrian Electronic Army claims to be behind the attack. Who said playing too many video games could damage your eyesight? 
scientists have discovered that a few rounds of Tetris can help treat lazy eye with the help of these specially designed goggles. Each eye is given different bits of information, forcing both to work together. Canadian professors at McGill University say playing the 80s video game using both eyes worked better than conventional patching of the good eye in a small study of 18 adults. And finally, out of this world or out of their minds, how about an interplanetary reality show based on a manned trip to Mars? Dutch non-profit organisation Mars One is already scouting for potential contestants for the one-way, seven-month trip, even though the tech isn't quite ready yet. When colonists arrive, they'd live in a specially designed habitat to protect them from Mars's extreme temperatures and thin atmosphere. It's not clear whether selling the global TV rights would pay for the trip, which is estimated at around $6 billion. Now, football may not be the first thing you think about when you're talking tech, except maybe the controversy over goal line technology. But one of the players and coaches, you ever wondered how they deploy the latest kit to keep themselves one yard ahead of the competition? Well, Richard Taylor went along to the England team's headquarters to find out. Nestled in the heart of England beats the heart of English football. St George's Park has been a decade in the making and for the first time a place all 24 national teams from senior first 11 through to junior girls can call home. With eight pitches, two hotels and state-of-the-art sports facilities it's been future-proof to provide a truly 21st century environment for training. One of the really useful things that we've done here is give players and coaches the ability to capture information in real time but then have that available to them at any time in the future. So whether they be back in their room, in the, in the training centre, wherever they might be, they can still access that information, analyse it, and obviously look to get better through it. So today it's my turn to get a taste of what the players experience. A quick practice on one of the two international size pitches tells me there's a bit of room for improvement in my own game before I hit the big time. But the pros don't need intuition, they have data by the bucket load to help them and their coaches. A dressing room dressing down used to consist of a pep talk and a bottle of orange squash. Not anymore. Here the centrepiece is a touchscreen TV connected to a laptop. It lets the coach perform highly sophisticated analysis of first half play, information which has been manually put into tablets from data collectors around the stadium. They measure things like successful passes, crosses, set plays and formations. All that data is synced up with video from strategically placed cameras. Using some software the coach can jump to any point in time and point out areas for improvement. For example, underperformers may need to pace themselves to retain their stamina or change their positioning. In all, it's a hatful of tricks and tools to help deliver that comprehensive win in the second half. Well, that's the theory. After the game, all that video and data can be crunched anew. Editing facilities compile and distribute the high or low lights online to give players and manager a chance to comment and reflect before they meet their next opponents. And it's not just players who benefit. The philosophy here is to impact the entire footballing ecosystem up and down the land. Whether it's analysing a player's position on the pitch, analysing their performance um, in terms of running, whatever data we can actually collect that enhances their performance or enhances the coach's performance, those small differences add up to, well, we hope a significant difference in time. But this place isn't just about improving performance through analysis. At its core, it's a training ground, keeping players at their peak fitness. And that's where the Human Performance Lab comes into play. At first glance, it looks just like your average gym, but on closer inspection, all the kit is pretty special. First stop for me, measure my vitals. These scales are so advanced, they measure not only your overall fat percentage, but break it down limb by chubby limb. They also give a frankly disquieting level of detail about your body's composition. Wow, look at that. Isn't that incredible? Fat, bone, protein. Well, lots of food for thought there and uh, maybe a little less food needed in there. But who knew that it was made up of 59% water? Football is increasingly about athleticism and to win the game you need to stay ahead of the game. 
This pressure plate is connected up to sensors. It analyzes your balance, both when you're standing or walking. The heat map showing exactly how you distribute your weight. And this treadmill has a slow motion camera combined with software to give players sophisticated gait analysis when they're running. All in all, both machines can identify potential problem areas before they become real injuries. Reactions are a vital part of the game. This helps monitor and improve peripheral vision. Great for goalies where every split second counts. Now it might look and sound a bit clinical and indeed this place can be a bit short on atmosphere. Take this altitude chamber which gives you a punishing workout by taking you a mile high in a matter of seconds. Aim higher still and you can get a workout which is well and truly uplifting. Let me introduce you to the anti-gravity treadmill, only found in very few elite sporting establishments. Air is pumped into the chamber, sealing in my lower body to reduce the effects of gravity by up to 80%. It feels a little bit like I'm running on air, and that's putting a lot less pressure on my joints, which of course is perfect for people who need to preserve them at all costs, like athletes, footballers, or even of course, just simply people recovering from an injury. A similar take on this concept is found in the hydration pool. Here, the water buoyancy is taking the strain. So, after all that intense training, the real question, at least for me, has my own play improved? Yes, seems like there's still a little way to go. Don't worry, Rich, at least you know what the goal looks like, which is more than I do. Uh, Rich Taylor there. Anyway, we move on. Now, this week's Webscape starts with a musical theme, and it's specifically for anyone who's ever wanted to learn to play an instrument. Now, the guitar is apparently a good one to start with, and Kate Russell has a little something to help get you strumming. One of the many ways the web has made learning more accessible is interactive music lessons. We've seen a few over the months, but here's a really simple and effective option if you want something free and simple that you can run at your own pace. Instinct. Like guitar bots that we looked at a few months ago, this app recognises the notes played through a microphone or the sound input. This isn't a game in the same way as guitar bots is, so it's not nearly as engaging. That said, you won't have to pay a monthly subscription. If you don't have a guitar, like me, you can play along virtually. Although there isn't really that much point as you're just twanging the strings as they become active on the screen. Sign up at yearofrock.com for a weekly lesson delivered by email. It's a good way to get a gentle reminder about your ambitions to become a rock star. If you've not been alone much, or if when you were, you weren't okay with it, then just wait. You'll find it's fine to be alone once you're embracing it. If you're more of a sit back and observe kind of person, check out this daily feed of inspiration at getinspired365.com. With a mixture of pictures, quotes and video, this collection has been lovingly compiled by hand, and it really hits the spot if you need a little morale boost. If you're shy, you can hang out with yourself in mirrors. You could put headphones in. The creators of this site started the database off by scouring the web for all the most amazing and inspiring content they could find. But you are encouraged to add your own to the collection so that it can grow organically. Subscribe to the site for a daily dose of internet goodness by email or just browse through the archive until your emotional cup runneth over and you can get on with your day with a renewed sense of purpose. The only way that you can really try to put it into scale with human reference is if you imagine Manhattan. This whole massive city just breaking apart in front of your eyes. Cam reporter from the Wall Street Journal. I'm in Portsmouth, Virginia. Heavy rain all day. We're getting more used to experiencing life in bite-sized pieces online. Twitter in 140 characters, Vine in video snips of six seconds. But if you want visuals with a little more punch, check out Tout, the new micro-blogging platform that lets you record or upload 15-second clips to share with the world. We have something via Tout, which is kind of like video for Twitter. Twitter. 
As we see citizen reporting becoming an increasingly important part of news delivery, this is exactly the kind of service that will make it easier than ever to get local stories out to the world really quickly, especially with the addition of free iOS and Android apps. If you followed our team at Mobile World Congress, you'll have seen Richard Taylor's touts from the expo floor. You might also notice he goes on a bit. Could this be the ultimate small PC in a box now? Up to 45 seconds. That's because media professionals can apply for upgraded accounts that give you 30 and 45 seconds record options. For everyone else, the limit is still 15 seconds, but it forces a headline state of mind, which I kind of like, and is perfect for building a conversation through the comments. Hi, Kate. Um, I love the background. I mean, England, Scotland and Ireland are beautiful. New out this week and causing a bit of a buzz, the perfect way to feel smug about your finances. Or not, as the case may be. Globalrichlist.com lets you compare your personal wealth with the rest of humanity, along with some rather thought-provoking stats. And last week, we reported on Twitter's new music service. But how's it shaping up? Well, it recommends music based on the artists you follow and some complex algorithms around track sharing. Personally, I only follow one artist, although he is pretty awesome. So what are my recommendations? Hmm, how on earth do you get from Tim Minchin to failed X Factor contestants Jedward? At this point, I'm afraid it lost all credibility for me. Thankfully, without a premium Spotify or radio account, I could only listen to a short preview. Kate Russell's Webscape. And as usual, all of those links are up at our website, bbc.co.uk slash click. And while you're there, you'll find a load of other tech stuff to read through and watch too, including a link to the Click Radio Show, which is on the BBC World Service. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can. We're on the email, click at bbc.co.uk. And you'll also find us socially on Google+, Facebook and Twitter, to name but three. That is it from Dublin, though. So thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.